Okay, good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started this evening. Angels, demons, and the unseen realm. And as I told some of you last Wednesday night that were there, there's going to be some things during this that are going to stretch you. They're going to stretch your mind, maybe some things that you haven't heard of before. Let me just tell a little bit about Dr. Heiser first, because that's the book that you purchased, Supernatural. Um, don't get thrown off by the title. Yeah, like get, get thrown off by the title. It'll, it'll do you good to be thrown off automatically. Uh, Heiser is a um, Hebrew scholar. He's got a degree in the Hebrew language uh, and ancient Near Eastern studies. Uh, he's got two, two PhDs in that. He's been the um, scholar in residence at Logos Bible Software. He's been on the uh, education staff, the, the teaching staff of Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's now at a seminary in Florida. I don't remember the name of it, writes full time. Uh, he actually, at the moment, has pancreatic cancer. So we're um, praying for him. But uh, this, is, this is something that uh, Dr. Heiser experienced. In, we're going to cover a lot of the things in these three books during this. So there's a lot to cover, a lot to, lot to work through. So let me just jump in. So, so through no fault of our own, I got, hope you ever got the notes. If not, there's a few copies up here. There's some in the back hallway. Through no, no fault of our own, we bring our own experiences, uh, our own heritage, our own worldview, and biases into anything that we read. And I was telling somebody earlier, uh, maybe Dana earlier before we started, that uh, in college uh, I was taking a Bible class, and uh, the, my teacher, we were working through something, and I commented, you know, raised my hand because I'm never, I'm never shy. And so I commented, and, and man, he called me out. He, he said, uh, John, what you're doing is eisegesis. And I was like, okay, I don't, I don't know what that is. And, and so he explained it to me. And I gave you here a definition, second paragraph, that eisegesis is an interpretation, especially of Scripture, that expresses the interpreter's own ideas, bias, or the like, rather than the meaning of the text. And, and we have a tendency to do that. That Greek preposition, EIS, means into, as in bringing our own thoughts into the text. And every one of us in this room, with all the different backgrounds that we've had, the different Bible teachers that you've heard, the different pastors you've had, the different books you've read, we have a, a certain amount of biases that come into our reading of the text of Scripture. And, and those things may be spot on, or some of them may be a little off, or some things may just be tradition and not necessarily based on, on the text. As a matter of fact, a lot of the things that you and I might believe about angels, demons, and the unseen realm may come from things like Paradise Lost or Dante's Inferno rather than Scripture. That, that very well could be. And so as we, as we work through this, we're going to make a commitment to stick to the text. Um, normally I use New American Standard. Tonight I'm using the ESV. Both of those are good translations. Uh, those of you who've, who've heard me tout the New American Standard for all these years, it's, it's still my favorite, but ESV tonight for a couple of different reasons. So... We all want God to be and act a certain way. If I were to put the word God up on that whiteboard and have it up in front of you and ask you to start thinking what comes to your mind when you see that word, more likely than not, you would come, you would come up with a series of attributes. You, you would come across some things that, that describe what kind of person God is, right? Um, that, that's just... That's often what we do, and often we want him to be and do what reflects our own desires. We want God to be a certain way because we think God ought to be this way, right? Um, so when we run into things in the Bible that conflict with our experiences, and we'll see a couple of those tonight, uh, we either ignore them or we explain them away or we determine they're unessential or we come up with our own meaning, some way to explain it. And none of those ways are profitable, and none of them will assist us in really knowing the God of the Bible. So what would be the most beneficial for us is to know God strictly as he has revealed himself in the text. That is the, the thing that we're going to do, set our mind and our heart upon this semester. So our best efforts to know God in this way is not eisegesis, but exegesis. It's a different word, but the word ex, the little preposition in the Greek language, means out of. And so what we do instead, uh, I gave you the definition there, it's a critical explanation or interpretation of a text or a portion of a text, especially the Bible. And this is called the grammatical historical interpretation method. So you're taking the truth from the text and you're bringing it out rather than bringing your own thoughts and your own biases into the text. Now, I'm just going to tell you, honestly, that's hard for me 
it's going to be extremely hard for you. It's extremely hard for me. I'm not trying to differentiate myself from you. I'm saying I'm right there with you. This is hard to just take the Bible as it's been given and, and see what the text has to say. All right. So what's essential to properly interpreting the Bible is to be certain that we're using the proper lens through which to view what it contains. And although the Bible can and does apply to our life now, we often use that to, um, you know, God, what do you want to say to me? We always, that's really kind of the question that we start with. God, what are you saying to me? Which is really the wrong question. The right question is, God, what are you saying? And then I'll adjust my life to you. But um, here's, a, here's a helpful phrase. The Bible was not written to me, but it was written for me. You understand that? And I'm, I'm not saying that God didn't intend for me to learn something from the Bible. What I'm saying is that the people who wrote, who copied, who um, received the instruction from God, and, and the people of the time that the Bible was recorded, that's who it was written for. Uh, to. But it's written for all of us. Sorry, I get that confused. So... Um, who was the Bible written to? And that's what we need to start with tonight. Tonight's called Through the Lens of the Ancient Near East. So there's no short answer to that question because there, there's so many factors to it. Ancient literary culture, textual criticism. How can we be... We, we can be sure, though, that the, the Bible's authors, the human authors, that is, God is the author, but the human uh, instruments that he used to write it, uh, an immediate audience were people of the ancient Near East. So here's a quote from Heiser on the second page of your notes. He said, It would be dishonest of us to claim that the biblical writers read and understood the text the way we do as modern people, or intended meanings that conformed to theological systems created centuries after the text was written. Our context is not their context. Seeing the Bible through the eyes of an ancient reader requires shedding the filters of our tradition and presumptions. They process life in supernatural terms. Today's Christian processes it by a mixture of creedal statements and modern rationalism. And really, that, that idea of rationalism is the biggest hurdle to you and I coming to an understanding of what the text says. And that's just that we are a product of our culture in that. We are a product of, the, of what we've been molded and shaped by an edu educational system or a governmental system or, or society around us. Rationalism, unfortunately, has caused us to look to the wrong source for truth. So a couple of things to help us. One, the Bible is oral tradition. First, we have to keep in mind, John Walton reminds us of this, ancient Near Eastern societies were hearing dominant. Uh, they had nothing comparable to authors and books as we know them. Nothing. Everything was oral. Uh, what, what this implies is that while authority remains, that authority is not as much contained in the one who transcribed truth into some form of a document, but held into one to whom the truth was given. For example... It's evident that Moses was not alive during the events of Genesis, right? But yet we have no trouble accepting that Moses was the author of Genesis. How is that true? Well, we, we believe that God gave him that information, presumably when he met with God on, the, on Mount Sinai, and that he gave Moses that information. Moses wrote it down, or someone wrote it down. That's, that's authority, but the authority was given to Moses and so the authority from God to Moses is what we have as the basis, not on the oral traditions prior to or the, the centuries and centuries of copying that, that has taken place. So uh, we always start there with the, the, the Bible is our authority. Um, the next thing is filtering the text. When taking in information, that information passes through filters in our thinking. Heiser writes this, the content I learned was filtered through certain presumptions and traditions that ordered the material for me, that put it into a system that made sense to my modern mind. We view the Bible through the lens of what we know and what's familiar. Our traditions, however honorable, are not intrinsic to the Bible. Now, I shudder to say this, but the Baptist faith and message of the Southern Baptist Convention is not this. It's good. It's based on this. It it's puts all the truths in a nice systematic form that we believe, but it's not authoritative. This is authoritative, right? So that, that's an example, and, and that's just one filter. There's all kinds of filters. It's those things I mentioned earlier, the pastor you grew up with, uh, a book that you read, a, a preacher you've heard on TV, whatever they might be. Lord, help. 
don't let it be a preacher on TV, but just <laughs> something, something that comes into your mind that filters, that you filter things through. So um, the mosaic, the next thing. Heiser again writes, the facts of the Bible are just pieces, bits of scattered data. Our tendency is to impose order. Now, that's me. I, I'm this close, if not beyond OCD. I am. Those of you who know me well, my wife can testify. I am OCD. Um, just a quick example. The ladies, women's ministry has a little thing called Find Your Spot this, this, fall, this uh, fall. And the, it's designed, the little poster was designed to look like a paint drop of a spot. And so when Carrie, my assistant, showed it to me, I was like, well, th those aren't perfectly round. That's not, I, I can't handle it. <laughs> she said, it's not what it's about. I said, okay, I, I just, it has to be perfectly round. I can't handle it. So I'm a little OCD. And, and so I have a tendency, and even it, it comes across in the way that I teach also. I want things in a nice linear order. Everything's got to make sense. Nice little outline form. This dot connects to this dot. Everything lines up. Nice, neat little package. Wrap it up. That's me. Some of you are like that. Others of you are not. I don't know how you're not, but it's okay. <laughs> and, and so we, the way we do that is we apply a filter. And we gain a perspective. When we look at the individual data, we gain a perspective that's both broader and deeper if we allow ourselves to see the pieces in their own wider context. We need to see the mosaic that all these pieces create. So have you ever seen one of those large posters? They were popular when, like when I was a teenager, probably. It just looks like colored little dots or something, and you're supposed to walk up to them and stare. <laughs> Take anybody else like 45 minutes to see something. Other. Just keep looking. I don't see anything. Those, those kind of things. Then all of a sudden, the picture kind of comes out. It's like a 3D image that comes out. of. That's, that's kind of what it's like. Um, when, when you... Uh, the, this is what the Bible does. When we learn it unfiltered, a pattern, a grand picture emerges that once it's seen, makes the whole work come alive. That's the excitement of what it, when you really get to understand the Bible as a whole. And I would just, I'll be honest with you. I was, I had made it through seminary. I'd graduated from seminary. I was on staff at First Baptist Church Beaumont. And I'll, I'll just be real with you. I didn't know what the Old Testament was about. Yeah, I knew some stories. I knew some names. I couldn't tell you what the, the overall thread that running through the Old Testament of timelines and who was where and who was what. and I, I didn't know that. I'd been to seminary. I didn't get it. Now, I mean, now I do, thankfully, as I've, as I've studied. But once you do, once you understand the grand overarching story of the Bible, it begins to make sense when you learn a new piece and, and you put it in place. So obstacles and protocols. We've been trained to think that the history of Christianity is the true context of the Bible. Christianity obviously didn't come along until Antioch. The, the disciples were called Christians at Antioch first. Little Christ. It was a, uh, um, it was a, sl a slang. It was, it was a put down. They were little Christ. These people were acting like little Christ. <laughs> so Christianity as we know it didn't come along until the end of the first century A.D. Well, there's a lot of Bible before that, right? Um, not discounting history in the least, but we have to understand that the Bible's true context precedes any of our creeds, Nicene Creed, Apostles' Creed, any of those things that came along in the, in the third, fourth, fifth centuries, confessionals, denominational preferences. The Bible's true context precedes all of those things. Now, while many of these creeds and confessions are true doctrinal statements that reflect the heart of God and the sufficiency of Scripture, they often don't account for the original context in which the Bible was written. In other words, we tend to want the Bible to speak primarily to us rather than first to understand it is being written to the people writing and to whom it was written. So, number two, we've been desensitized to the vitality and theological importance of the unseen world. Here's an example. If I, if I were to come here tonight and said, we all can agree that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. How many of you would raise your hand at that? It's not a trick question. It's, we all believe that Jesus was born. That, okay. That's weird, right? That's supernatural. We have no problem believing that. But I start to mention something like here in just a minute, when we start to look at something like the divine counsel, you go, well, that's false. No, that's not true. <laughs> that can't happen. There's no way. So we, we discount that because of biases and things that, are, that, are, that we just push away. 
Many conservative evangelicals avoid the supernatural events in the Bible because of the belief that it could even lead towards something charismatic. Oh my goodness, we'll just avoid it. Okay, number three, we assume that a lot of things in the Bible are too odd or peripheral. I, I can't tell you how many commentaries I pull off the shelf when I get to a tough passage. I say, well, let's see what so-and-so had to say about that, and I'll go to it. Uh, yeah, he didn't say anything. He just skipped that. <laughs> Heiser tells a story in his, uh, I'm not sure if it's in the little book or the larger book, about going to a church that they went several Sundays. They really liked it. Pastor was preaching through First Peter, and he came to the, to the text. Is it in the little book? The, where, where he talks about the, um, uh, the angels you know, that sinned and were kept in bonds. And he's, the pastor even admitted, well, I'm, I'm not going to, we're going to skip this. We're going to skip it. Why? Why? That's important. It's important. And so Heiser, if you listen to him, he will tell you that the weird in the Bible is usually important. All right, so a little bit more about the people of the ancient Near East. They had a viewpoint that there was a spiritual realm, an unseen realm that played a very significant role in the operation of things on the earth. The people of the ancient Near East were attuned to the heavens, right? I was talking with Aaron about this today, Aaron Librand, because he just got back from Turkey. And if, if, you're, if you've been in a place, you can maybe out West Texas or Colorado, some places where the, the skies are not quite as filtered as other places where you can actually see the stars, you begin to, if you look up for very long, you notice that it, lo it looks like there's a, there's a symphony going on. You know, it just looks like things are moving as they ought. It's just a beautiful picture. Well, they, they saw the, the sky unfiltered. They saw the stars, the planets, the constellations, clearer than in any other time in history. And the skies moved and seemed to have patterns and organizations. And, and as, as scholars have made archaeological excavations, they've earned thousands of relics and writings from the ancient Near East, uh, those civilizations in the last century alone. And those, the understanding of those cultures has come into tighter focus. <clears throat> only in this century, I'm sorry, only in the 20th century did those things, 1928 was a huge year for <clears throat> particularly these ancient Near Eastern studies because there was a whole swath of things uncovered at Ugarit uh, that was a, that's a similar uh, culture to the Hebrew people. It was a Mesopotamian culture. And the way that they looked at society and looked at the world gives us an indication of how the Hebrew people looked at the world and the cosmos. So a lot of those things have just come into to being. But almost every ancient culture has some kind of origin story. They have, a, they have a creation story. They have a flood account. They, they have all these similar things to the Bible. And, and it, if you start to look at all those different pieces, you see that there must be a grand story going on, and each culture interprets it and, and envelops it into their system in the way that their cultural norms and filters fit. Does that make sense? So while many of these fragments and documents that uh, scholars have uncovered are classified as myths, we're not to dismiss their value. Myths is another one of those words that for you and I, we say a myth and we think of uh, a fable or we think of something that's not true. We think of Greek mythology and we think of something that's just completely false and it's just for entertainment value. Well, John Walton writes this. He says, myths as a genre are not false. They are a mode of conveying meaning that is different from the mode we call history. Classifying a text as myth is not an assessment of its veracity. It's an observation about what the text was written to communicate and how it goes about doing so. Modern interpreters assume, for example, that when the ancients spoke of the sun as a god sailing across the sky in a boat, they were trying to describe the same thing we describe when we speak of the sun as a ball of burning gas with a ball of rock called earth orbiting around it. In fact, mythic imagery is intended to describe function and relationship to other elements of the cosmos, not mechanism or phenomena. Classifying the sun as a god does not describe what it's made out of, but rather what it does. In this case, that its journey across the sky delineates order for the earth below, since establishing and preserving order is a function of the gods. That was a key belief of the ancient Near Eastern people. Gods brought order. Gods provided function. They did something. There was a god that provided the sun. There was a god that provided the rain. There was a god that provided the crops to grow. All of those things... Um, in another work, Walton writes this. this. This will help you with this. He says, there's no such word as religion in the languages of the ancient Near East. Likewise, there's no dichotomy between sacred and secular, or even between natural and supernatural. 
The only suitable dichotomy is between spiritual and physical, though even that would be a less meaningful distinction to the people of the ancient Near East than it is to us. In the end, there's a distinction between the heavenly realm and the earthly one. But events in the two were often intertwined or parallel. It would be difficult to discuss with ancients the concept of divine intervention because in their worldview, deity was too integrated into the cosmos to intervene in it. The world was suffused with the divine. All experience was religious experience. All law was spiritual in nature. All duties were duties to the gods. All events had deity as their cause. Life was religion, and religion could not be compartmentalized within life. Very different from us. We are good at compartmentalizing religion, right? And I even hesitate to use the word religion because that's not what we believe. We believe in relationship with Jesus. But they, they had the worldview that the divine, the deity, the God, the heavens was paramount to every facet of their life. It infused every aspect of their life. That's what they were thinking. So they had a keen eye and a keen view of the spiritual realm. And so it's impossible for us to truly see the world the way someone from the ancient Near East saw it. We must at least try to rid ourselves of any preconceived notion or assumption that we bring when reading the Bible. We must be willing to focus only on the text and believe that God's provided what's necessary on its pages for us to know Him in all of His fullness, right? So let's go to the Scripture. Psalm 82. Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 82. As I told you, I'm in the ESV uh, tonight, and it's for just some, for some matters of translation. This is the text that, and I'm not sure if Heiser goes into it in the little book. Um, it's on the back cover. Okay, it's on the back cover, thank you. Heiser was a professor, he was at church one morning, and um, one of his fellow uh, teachers said, have you ever read Psalm 82? He said, of course I've read Psalm 82, I've read it all the time. And he said, look at it in the Hebrew. Now Heiser, knowing the Hebrew language, took one look at it, and his jaw dropped. He said, I've never seen it before. What did he see? Here's what he saw. Let's read, let's read it first, then we'll go through it. Psalm 82. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. And deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. <clears throat> Anything about that passage bother you? Anything stick out there? Anybody ever seen the word divine counsel before? Not many of us. Okay. Neither at Heiser. He read it. So look, look, this is what he did. The first verse of the psalm is packed with information. First, we're given insight into something that may be very unfamiliar, that divine counsel. What is that? Uh, well, the first time I noticed it, when I read Psalm 82, before I'd even read Unseen Realm or anything like that, I assumed it was a reference to the Trinity, to the Godhead. That's what I thought. Um, those of you who, who've been with me for a while know that I, I wrote a book called, about Christ in the Old Testament. And that was one of the places where I noted that there's a reference to Christ in the Old Testament. God, God is speaking to the Godhead there. Well, I, I didn't read the rest of the psalm. Because if you read the rest of the psalm, it says, if it's indeed God talking to the Trinity or to the Godhead, he says in verse 2, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Well, the Godhead's not wicked. The Godhead is not unjust. So... Who's he talking to then? There's got to be something else, right? Um, why is there this accusation of judging unjustly? Secondly, we see the word God and gods in verse 1. God, Elohim, is the Hebrew word there, has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. Same word, same Hebrew word for God in the very first part of verse 1 and gods later on in the verse. Same Hebrew word. What do we do when we see the same word? It's the same. I mean, it's not, it's not two different words there. He's not introducing a new concept. All right, so uh, let me just kind of read from what I wrote so I don't get off track. 
Uh, I assumed when I first read it that there were two different Hebrew words, um, but that's not the case. Both of those words are the Hebrew word Elohim. Elohim is a plural noun. That's, we know that because it's got I am on the end of it. If you look at a Hebrew word, it's got I am. That means there's two. It's the equivalent of us putting an S on an English word. It, it, it implies plurality. So uh, the first title is translated as singular, God. The second use gods is the same word, same form. Why is it, then is it translated differently? Well, we have already determined that this psalm is not referencing the Godhead. Then it must describe another group of people. Maybe not people. Maybe that's not the right word. It must describe a council made up of other spiritual beings. Uh, even saying that, I'm just being honest. With you, even saying that up here makes me go, oh, that sounds weird. Does it sound weird to you? It does? It's okay. I mean, it, yeah, it sounds weird for me to say. It. It's all right. So uh, there are many scholars, many. I mean, I, when, when Heiser writes, I, I don't want you to think I'll say Heiser a lot. I, Heiser himself will tell you he has not have, had original thought. He is, he is simply synthesizing the information that has been written throughout the centuries. He's bringing it together. He's not making this up on his own. He's an evangelical Trinitarian. He believes all the same normal stuff that we believe. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. God is a trinity. God created the world. He, he believes all those things. But then there's these things that he's noticed. So um, there, are, there are many scholars who hold the understanding that the divine council referenced here are Jewish elders. That's one, if you, if you pull a, a commentary from the mid-20th century, uh, somebody like J. Vernon McGee or, um, I don't know, uh, Ironside or somebody like that, they'll say that, well, that, that's, that's talking about Jewish elders is what that's talking about. Okay, well, let's hold that up with the rest of the text. Because remember, the text is what tells us, not somebody's commentary, right? So we look at verse 6 and verse 7, and it says, <clears throat> I said, you are gods, Elohim, same word. Sons of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die, implying that they were not like men to begin with. So obviously it's not a group of Jewish elders. Matter of fact, if you just go a little forward to Psalm 89 for just a second. I don't think I put this in here, did I? Yeah, I did. Five and six. Good, I'm glad I did. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Okay, well, that, all of a sudden, and Heiser says it, well, he jokes about it. He says, I don't know about you, but I don't read in my Bible a bunch of Jewish guys in the sky. That, that's not there. Not Jewish elders. This, this is something else. Spiritual beings. Sons of the Most High. All right, so um, the Lord in, in these verses, by the way, in your Bible, should be printed as all caps. Capital L and then small caps, O-R-D, right? When you see that in your, in your translation, your Bible, when you see that printing of L-O-R-D, that is for you to see that is Yahweh, the divine name. That is, that's talking about the divine God, Yahweh, right? So that's when you see that all caps, that's what that means. So how do we know that Elohim here at the end of the verse should be translated God's plural with an S? If it's the same as Elohim in the first part of the verse. The words in the midst of gives the reason. You can't be in the midst of one, right? In the midst implies more than one. So you see the word Elohim is not, to, not meant to produce a series of attribute, attributes. Remember when I told you if we put God up on the board and asked you to describe what that meant? Well, you might say things like loving, holy, just, righteous, omniscient, things that describe uh, attributes of who God is. That's not the intention of this word Elohim. This Elohim is a word that describes, it's a title. It's a title. The meaning of the word Elohim is any inhabitant of the unseen spiritual realm. Heiser writes this. That's why you'll find it used of God himself. It's used of demons in Deuteronomy 32, of the human dead in the afterlife in 1 Samuel 28. For the Bible, he writes, any disembodied being whose home address is the spirit world is an Elohim. It's simply a descriptor of a title of what they are. Everybody got that? No. <laughs> right. Good answer. Good answer. So in Psalm 82, we see the text, to the text describes an unseen realm, a realm in the skies or the heavens, if you will, unseen to humans where Yahweh, the Most High, dwells with other spiritual beings that he created. 
Some of these spiritual beings are working with God's plan to reconcile all of creation to himself. Others are working against God's plan to reconcile all his creation. Okay, is that, I know it's, it's still sounding weird, right? But when you think about it in this way, if you step back and you looked at, okay, God is, as our creator, he created you and I, right? He created humans, Adam and Eve, and then from there on. He, he created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve procreated and filled the earth. So he, he created a family, a human family. It's not that far a stretch to think that he created a spiritual family before he created a human family. And so that's what, that's what these scholars who, who understand this believe, that God created a spiritual family. And that spiritual family has been given the same freedom and opportunity to image God as we have. And if we look across our neighborhoods, our place of work, we know that not all people that we know image God, right? Not all people are believers. They're not all Christians. They don't all act like Christ. Well, the same is true in the spiritual realm. Because God has given a sense of freedom for people to image who God is, he has given them the, the freedom to reject him, accept him, to live, work according to him, or work against him. You say, well, why would he do that? Why, why, would, God, why would God give uh, supernatural beings the, the freedom to work against him? Well, because he is, what does John say, First John? God is what? Love. We have to remember in the overall context, the overarching characteristic of who God is, is love. And with love comes freedom. It would not be love if we were machines that were programmed to act and respond in a certain way and only do what we're programmed to do. It would not be love. And so he has given us the responsibility and the freedom to work with him or work against him because he loves us and wants there to be a proper response. He wants to involve us. So how does this play out? What impact does this, ha this have on us, God's human family? Now turn to Deuteronomy 32. But before, as you're turning there, let me just kind of wrap up Psalm 82. So Psalm 82, this is a psalm of Asaph. This is not David here writing this, but he's, he, he's given us a glimpse into this uh, unseen realm, and he's recognizing that something in the, in the unseen realm is wrong. There's something that's not right in the unseen realm, and he's saying, how long, God, are you going to put up with this? Oh, God, come and judge the earth, because something's not right here. Right? That's, that's basically Psalm 82. All right, now Deuteronomy 32. Again, out of the New American Standard. Oh, sorry, ESV. Sorry. Thank you, Jim. Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. I don't know if you've noticed this. I'm sure you've all read it as you've read through the Bible. Maybe like at 11 o'clock at night when you've got them in your ears and you're half asleep, just, but you're checking the box that you read it. <clears throat> you don't do that, do you? Yeah. I know. I know you do because I do it too. All right. So look at verse 8. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance. When he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Okay, anybody have the NIV in the room? Several of you do. Does it say sons of God there in verse 8? Israel. Does it list sons of Israel in the oldest Hebrew text that we have? Because the oldest Hebrew text that we have comes after the Septuagint. Septuagint, oh, I'm going to give you a whole lot here. Try to hang with me. Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That it was done in the, in the 300s BC after Alexander the Great when he wanted to teach the world to speak Greek. He commissioned 70 scholars to translate the Old Testament into Greek. And that was called the Septuagint. Uh, Septa is 70, that's, that's where it comes from. And so they, they translated that. So the Masoretic text, the oldest documents, the oldest manuscript that we have in our possession is hundreds of years after that, and it says sons of Israel. But the Septuagint that was written 300 B.C., now we don't have a document from 300 B.C., but we have one later than the Masoretic text. It says sons of God. Jonathan? The word Israel literally means wrestles with God. Wrestles with God, yes. So could there be some credit lent for that meaning and the use of that word? Um, it, it possibly, except for the, except for that there's the word sons there. Okay. Ben, uh, B'nai Elohim is the, is the word in the Hebrew, sons of God. So without that, without sons there, yes, you would, you kind of look at it as what is the original meaning of, of Israel. Um, but if you're looking at the Masoretic, to, I mean the, uh, Septuagint, uh, Israel's not even there. It's sons right. of God, right. B'nai Elohim. 
so uh, you know we we have that there and so you're, you're looking at okay so like milt said this is not necessarily humans so these are sons of god if they're the same as, as psalm 82 says then then who are these uh so we read it we read in psalm 82 and psalm 89 that the sons of god could have referred to spiritual beings gods as psalm 82 put it everybody with me are y'all okay is your mind is your head spinning is it just me okay all right so there, there are other passages of Scripture too. Please don't think that there's just two. There are, there are many, many other passages. I'll, I'll show you another one in a minute. But there are many, many other passages that refer to these sons of God. And, and we'll look at these throughout the semester. But Heiser and other scholars reading this text in light of the unseen realm and the divine counsel idea believe this passage refers to the events around the Tower of Babel. That the, Moses, as he's, this is the Song of Moses. So Moses, remember, Moses is the one who got everything from God on Mount Sinai and wrote everything down and, you know, passed it down. So Moses is recounting for the Israelites, he's recounting the activity of God through the ages at this point. And so scholars believe that this is referring to the Tower of Babel. Now, we'll cover the Tower of Babel event in great detail in a few weeks. But let me just give you a little bit of, of stuff about it now. Suffice it to say, it occurred during a time of great rebellion against God. The people all spoke one language. Remember Genesis 11. All the people spoke one language. They were constructing a tower or a ziggurat. A ziggurat. Like a pyramid, but, but they were more flat levels on the way up, not just a straight peak. By the way, other ancient civilizations, ancient Near Eastern civilizations built ziggurats also. And they used them as a portal to try to get their god to come down. That was why they built it, the ziggurats. So the people of Israel... Are, are basically doing the same. They're not Israel then. The people of God, these, the, uh, the uh, descendants of, of Noah and his three sons, they're doing the same thing. They want to be like all the other nations. Remember the, what they say in Genesis 11, so that we can make a name for ourselves, right? So they're doing the same thing. So they construct a ziggurat, um, and realizing that his people had completely rejected him. Yahweh, God, confused their language, and he scattered them abroad over the face of the earth, right? That's what happens in Genesis 11. By the way, chapter 10 of Genesis describes 70 different descendants of Noah. Presumably these, presumably these became the 70 nations that are scattered abroad over the face of the earth, the table of nations. In doing this, God gives them over, much like he does in uh, Romans chapter 1, where, where he gave them over to their sinful desires. He gave them over to their continual rebellion. He gave them over. He rejected them, basically. Uh, and so rather than the blessings of a relationship with their creator, Yahweh, they get land. Now, these are spiritual beings. So God, these, these sons of God here uh, are, are the ones who are given authority and dominion over geographical areas. The, the, the people that, that God, that had rejected God, the human people, the descendants of, of Noah and the table of nations, those 70 nations, he scattered them across the face of the earth and they, and they created basically nations 70 nations and and so god took his spiritual family and he one by one he said all right that you kent little g god kent you're going to be over this area and you're going to be over this area and, and and i'm giving you dominion and authority over those but then what does he say in verse 8 but the lord's portion is his people jacob his allotted heritage he's saying this little stretch of land this little nation this little land here by uh, the mediterranean sea this little strip of territory that's about the size of Connecticut, yeah, that's mine. I'm keeping that. It's mine. So what did he do right after that in Genesis 12? He called Abram from Ur of the Chaldeans, from another nation. He called him over and his wife Sarah. What was, the, what was one of the most unique characteristics about Abram and Sarah? Barren. They were barren. They couldn't have kids. And so God now is creating a people through Abram and Sarah in a way that only God could create it. They couldn't have done it themselves without God's intervention. And so God takes Abram and he blesses him. I've probably gotten way off my notes here. Um, God gives a part of his creation over to the other divine beings that were in the unseen realm and grants them a certain amount of limited authority to govern and control those nations. If, if you heard me preach a couple weeks ago out of, out of the book of uh, Colossians, is that where it was? Philippians? I don't know what book I was in. But remember when it said, when, remember when the, the text said, that he disarmed the rulers and authorities. These are the rulers and authorities that were set up. And when Christ died on the cross, he took their authority away. And as Jesus appears to his disciples after the resurrection, 
What does he say before the Great Commission? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So now go and make disciples. All of that's tied up into this. He's given authority to the sons of God, these divine beings. And from that point on, chaos. And so when, he, when, Joshua, when Joshua comes along and he tells Joshua to go into the land, he's going, in, he's going into lands that are controlled by sons of God that are disobedient. And so he says, wipe them out. You see how it all fits? Because we wonder, why would God give a command to Joshua to go wipe out nations? Because they were responsible. Because they rejected God. They had a time to reject God, I mean, to accept God, and they didn't. They rejected him. And he said, I'm starting anew. I'm, I'm, I'm starting over. That's, what, that's what's happening. Verse 9 of this is, I already said that, very important. Lord's portion is the people of Jacob. Yahweh chooses a 75-year-old man named Abram who had a wife that could bear no children. With these two people, he began... Uh, his nation, his allotted heritage. Meanwhile, huh? Yeah, Albert. Were those where Joshua was coming in with the giants? Yes, giants, the, the Nephilim. Yeah, Nephilim. Nephilim. We'll get to those. Those are that's one of the things that will be in the next couple of weeks. We'll talk about them specifically. So, meanwhile, these other nations would become the Gentiles, people that are not gods, not, not God's people. Sorry, that was confusing. Uh, a people who had rejected Yahweh. So other gods, other little g, other Elohim, divine beings, would rule those nations and create chaos and disorder. And they would lead those nations away from Yahweh and turn them toward their own desires and pleasures. Don't misunderstand. These other gods had powers. When, we, when you read in the Bible about Moloch or about Marduk or Baal, Baal or any of those gods that are named with a little g, they are divine beings who had power. Say, well, I don't know about that, John. I don't. Yeah, okay. Well, look, look at uh, Exodus. Look at Exodus when Moses is coming before Pharaoh, who, by the way, Pharaoh, uh, kings in that time and, and pharaohs, they believed that they were gods. They believed that they were God's instruments. They were just as much God as the God who they sacrificed to. So they come before Pharaoh, and the, Pharaoh brings his people. Moses is there, and God's doing something. And, and Pharaoh's gods had power, didn't they? They did some things. Limited. They, they limited. That's right. Limited authority. Yes, but that's these were real people. When you read the Bible about other nations worshiping other gods, it's not something that's just made up. Those are not just figments of imagination. Those are real beings who are dead set against God's plan. That's who they are. And so now, the let me just kind of finish this off. Um. Where was I? Table of Nations, 70 nations, given the... Okay, so the, this Table of Nations, when God scatters the people, I know some of you have all heard this a hundred times now, but the word scattered is if you drop a glass on the floor and shards go everywhere. He, he separates the people all over the face of the earth. And, and so then the rest of the Bible is about God's reclamation project. And God, for the rest of, of the Bible, God is reclaiming those nations. He's bringing his people back to himself uh, from those who are opposed to him. And so if you took the, the table of nations, when I say table of nations, it's those 70 nations that, that were the, the end result of Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. If you took those 70 nations and you put it over a map of the nations that were represented at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, it's the same places. God at, at Pentecost God is beginning, Christ has come and conquered, he's taken away the authority of those nations, and now he's getting them back. And as the church spreads into those, those same nations, they're taking the gospel into those nations, and God is reclaiming that land. And one day, one day, he's going to have all the, when the fullness of the Gentiles come, he's going to come back again, and he's going to receive us, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But all that's tied together in this. So already... Through this, we've been introduced to concepts that are more than likely very unfamiliar to us in many ways. We've seen an unseen realm. We've seen heavenly beings. Um, we've seen a council of gods. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Don't worry. I'm not, not just going to leave that behind. These, these lesser divine beings carry out the work of Yahweh, the Most High God or the God of the Bible. One, one last thing. It's not in your notes, but just, just so that I don't leave you confused. It may be confusing for you to think that there's Yahweh God and there's other gods with him and he's meeting with them. 
over and over, there, there's a dozen or more places in the Old Testament where, where the Bible says, you are a God of gods. There is no one like you, God. There is no one like you. And, and, and the, the, the Bible is saying that among those Elohim, there is no one like Yahweh. He's, he's, not, he's not saying that there's not other gods. The biblical writers are saying there's no other gods that are like our God, like Yahweh. No one can do what he can do. The living, the living God. He is the most high. And the, the one true living God. Amen. <laughs> one, it's hot in here. Okay, Robbie. The Ziggurats were those the high places that they're always talking about. The kings didn't tear down. And... Um, could be, but not necessarily. A high place could be just on a mountain. Okay. Uh, that's another part of what we'll get into, um, because because temples uh, of ancient Near Eastern people uh, were either in gardens or on mountains or both a garden on top of a mountain. Mountains were significant to the thought of ancient Near Eastern cultures building temples. So ziggurats were sometimes used, but sometimes it was a mountain. And we'll see several scholars that think that Eden was a garden on a mountain. Yeah, Jesse. Great question. Great, great question. Glad you asked that. So, yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. So, basically, what Jesse's saying is, if, if God disarmed them at the cross, then what are they? What are they doing? Well, disarm, disarm them. If you remember my sermon from a few weeks ago, I used the Christmas story example. Scott Farkas. No one was afraid of, of Scott Farkas after Ralphie beat him up. Um, for those of you who didn't hear the sermon, you're like, "What's he talking about?" <laughs> um, but it, it's it basically the disarm the disarmament was that it removed the fear and the barrier to coming to God. That was removed. They're still active, and they will, not be, they will not be completely judged until the end when they're cast into the lake of fire. So they're still active. And so what it means for you and I, I'll tell you what this study has done for me. It's helped me to understand why we pray, because there are real enemies, just like the verse that Jesse said in Ephesians. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in, in heavenly places, heavenly places, unseen realm, that, that are at war. And they, those, those powers that I think are still over the nations influence the nations. They lead. Now, we're responsible for our sin. That doesn't excuse us from, from sin. We sin. We mess up. We screw things up. The earth is broken, yes. But in addition... These, these spiritual beings who are set against God are, could be the result of some of the things that we see in the world when it comes to chaos-related things. Wow, lots of hands everywhere. Mandy, I saw yours first. In, in Genesis, where it says, let us, yeah. in Genesis 1, is that this? Okay, so I always understood it as the triangle. I did, I did too. I put it in my is, book. <laughs> is the us then not that, or is it? I mean, yeah, I Heiser says... Heiser and others say that, that that's the divine counsel that led us. All, all the, 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 yeah. Yeah, n yes. The, it, it's, it's, no, that's the Godhead. But, he's ta but what Heiser and others refer to is that all of those little Gs, all those Elohim. Those are the us. The us, yeah. Um, but yeah, but so, so what we don't know, what we don't know is when that rebellion we don't know a timeline of when that rebellion happened. We have nothing that indicates that when God created a spiritual family that there was anyone against him, that any of those were against him. Somewhere a fall came. Somewhere a divine being rebelled and became, I'm getting way ahead now, but became uh, a tempter to Eve that led her and, and Adam to sin. One of those divine beings did, yes. So we don't know if they're all on board still at that point when they led us. Um, so how does Jesus and the Holy Spirit, how do they fit into this? They, God they are, the yeah, they are not lesser they're divine the, beings. They are the Godhead. They're with Yahweh. They are they Yahweh. Are Yahweh. Okay. Jesus is God. 
Yeah, Jesus is God, but he's not the Father and he's not the Spirit. The Spirit is God, but he's not the Father and not the, not the Son. Godhead. Godhead. Yes. Good question. Good question. Okay, there were lots. Um, I had read his book a number of years ago, and one of the things that helped me a lot was to see it as God's government. Yes. Thank you. He is the creator. Yes. And then he has, just like we have governors and we have congressmen and all that, he has the same thing. He appointed people, and you're going to be in charge of this area, and you're going to be in charge of that. Exactly. And we see it again in Daniel. Yes. Yes. When Daniel prays. (laughs) And Very good. This prince of Persia, and yes. prince of Greece, and there, and you see these beings, and we read it and we just go, eh. Well, <laughs> exactly. Go. But that's what we're seeing. We're yes. Seeing these warring spiritual. Yes. Very good. Yes. Let me expand on that for just because that's spot on. So in what she's talking about in Daniel, uh, Daniel's praying, and and he's asking the Lord for help because he doesn't he. He's looking at the, his exiled people, and he's like, okay, Lord, how much longer? And so he's praying. He's calling out to God. And the, the angel Michael comes to him, comes to Daniel. And he said, I'm, he basically, I'm paraphrasing. He says, I'm sorry, I was, but I was delayed by the prince of Persia. And that, that word prince equates to a deity, a son of God, a, a sons of God, Elohim person that Michael was at war with in the unseen realm who was being delayed to, so he could come to Daniel. So that, that's, that's in there too. And so, uh, yes, the administration too. The way that for you and I to think about it is, for you and I, we understand it as government, but most every other ancient Near Eastern civilization had a monarchy. They had a king. And who, who, was, who were the ones that were closest to the king? His family, right? And from his family, then he had other lesser, yeah, less, that, that it carried out the, the business of the, of the kingdom. Same kind of structure. And so you look at that structure similar to the other ancient Near Eastern cultures. Mill. Is it allowable to make a differentiation in this group of gods between angels and demons? Is that where we're going? Because uh-huh. uh, the angels lost their first state and they're confined. Yeah. But obviously taking Daniel... There are some very powerful spiritual beings. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, let me talk about that for just a second, just to give it a little preview. So when we talk about angels, the word angels in, in the, Hebrew, in the uh, Old Testament is malach. It, just, it simply means a messenger. That's all it means. So you, we have to get out of our head the little images of puffy angels with wings and harps. Get that out of your head because there is nothing in the Bible that describes angels like that. Angels are powerful beings. And there are different kinds of angels. There's cherubim, there's seraphim, there's throne guardians. Uh, a, a lot of scholars believe that um, the the the, uh, the one who um, the shining one who influenced Eve in the garden was a throne guardian of God. Um, the, there were different appearances, and so angels were simply messengers. They they they're they're not even we don't even know that angels have wings. Cherubim did because we know that, but so. We kind of have to get that out of our minds that they were just a messenger, a delivery service, basically the postal service of heaven, if you will. Maybe uh, uh, it's postal service. Yeah. <laughs> all right, they're all. <laughs> um, okay, what else? Um, oh yeah, as far as demons, yeah. A- Milt mentioned the demons, oh, the angels who left their estate. I-, I would say that those are spiritual beings, the sons of God. It's Genesis six, and we'll look at that in detail. Uh, they're not necessarily angel. Peter calls them angels because that's different in the Greek. It's angelos. It's a different word. So, um, but in, in the Old Testament, it would still be a son of God or a divine being who left their estate and came. It looks like that this study is building a real hierarchy. Yes. Uh, when you mentioned mm-hmm. uh, monarchs using their sons, I thought yes. of David and all of his sons yeah. managing everything. In Definitely. Definitely building a hierarchy in the spiritual realm. And listen, listen, folks. One day, when Christ comes again, there's going to be another. Mon- there's going to be another hierarchy set up, and the Book of Hebrews says that we will rule angels. We, as the new sons and daughters of God, will rule angels. We're going to rule in God's kingdom. Uh, John, you've held your hand up a long time. Creation. Okay. In the beginning. Uh huh. Oh, oh, it's still, yeah, good, good thought. It's still there. Does this study, is it going to talk about 
N no, not really. Not really, but, but we still, that doesn't, this doesn't change creation. Uh, El Yah Yahweh, Yahweh with the beginning. Nothing, because John 1 tells us there was nothing in the beginning but God. He was in the beginning with God, Jesus. But the whole concept, you know, so the God. Today, I mean, that basically started time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, what happened before that? Thousands of years? We don't know. Years? We don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that we we don't know. I we we can't we don't have a way to mark to mark that and, and come to a solid conclusion. You either take the Bible at what it says, six literal days or periods of time. There's there's arguments on either side. Doesn't change the fact that God created. Yahweh created. Yahweh created all all things. These the other divine beings weren't there at the Hmm? What's again? No, it's talking about God. It's talking about Yahweh. It was the there was before there was anything? There was Yahweh, and then He created the spiritual realm, and then He created the physical realm, the the humans. Okay, Albert, real yes, quick, sir, I'm right out of time. Is John, and the word Satan, Hasatan in the Hebrew. Hasatan. Hasatan is the opposer. Mm -hmm. I just thought of That's it. Yeah, we'll get to that too. Hasatan is the accuser. Ha Satan, Satan is a title. Yeah. It's not a person. Hello. That's, that'll whet the appetite a little bit. It's not a person. It's a title of an accuser. And what I believe, I believe that it's, it's a member of God's spiritual realm whose job it is to accuse. He's doing exactly what God tells him to do. The accuser does. Now I'm talking, you've got to get out of your mind what you think of Satan. There are demons. There are um, spiritual beings who are opposed to God that are, that are working evil ways. But the Satan is not one of those. You see it in Job chapter 1. In the, when there was again, the council met in Job chapter 1. And, and the Satan, Hasatan, the Satan, appeared before. Have you considered my servant Job? He, that's, he's, like the Ron, he's like the district attorney. Chief prosecutor. Chief prosecutor, maybe a better, better way to put it. Yeah, so we'll get to that in, in more detail. The opposer is the term. Opposer, yeah. Yeah. All right, I think uh, that's probably enough for one night. So read, read the first couple of chapters of uh, Supernatural, and, and maybe it'll make a little more sense than me. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we'll get to the Divine Rebellions. There's three Divine Rebellions that we'll get to, and among other things. So let me pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Pray that uh, we would find your word as the source of our truth, that we would stick to the text. Um, Father, that, that we would not be enamored by a theory or by a person who wrote a theory or uh, by a scholar, that we would be enamored by you and you alone. You are the source of our truth. You are the God most high. You are the living one, the one who is above all, no one like you. And so we worship you and we hold you in reverence and we want to learn of you. We want to know you personally. Thank you that you made a way for us to know you personally by the, by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. In stream. Woo!